Hello and welcome to Slow Art, brought to you by the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. I'm Janelle Montgomery, and in this episode, we'll be spending time with Wangit Shimutu's The Seated Three from 2019. When I first encounter the seated three, I'm struck by her presence. She stands about seven feet tall, although she seems a bit taller because of the pedestal. She is, of course, seated, but once she stands, she'll be much bigger. I still think she'll not touch the ceiling here, though. Her elongated neck arms and fingers and tight coiffure reiterate her height and erect posture. Her expression is relaxed, but she is in an alert at the ready pose. She's placed in a pavilion overlooking the pond in a space called an ngawa, neither inside nor outside. The artist, Wangechi Mutu, was born in 1972 in Nairobi, Kenya, and now divides her time between there and Brooklyn. She has an MFA in sculpture from Yale University and a BFA from Cooper Union. In 2019, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City commissioned Mutu to fill the museum's facade niches facing Fifth Avenue. For an exhibition called The New Ones Will Free Us, she designed four variations on the seated theme. The seated three is a mirror image of the seated one, and the other pair, the seated two and four, are also mirror images of each other. Beside their poses and the drape of the coils, the sculptures differ in the nuances of patina, facial details, and the placement of a flat, polished disc. These discs reflect ambient light and have functional and fashionable associations. The seated one recalls an ornamental lip plate or a megaphone. The seated two, a crown, a top knot, or a satellite receiver. The seated three, a halo or a tight bun. And the seated four, a saucy chapeau or face shield. Each figure is cast in an addition of three. They were the first art to occupy the niches at the Met since the building's completion in 1902. Mutu conceived the seated during a period of heated political rhetoric around immigration, although well before the added tensions of coronavirus lockdowns and protests for racial justice. She imagined the figures as sources of hope and strength. The Met Commission resulted from Mutu's work exploring gender, race, conflict, and consumption. In this collage from 2015 called Forbidden Fruit Picker, she mixes the traditional and exotic, so the forms all look familiar, but they are rendered with textures and colors that make them strange. In a sculpture called Water Woman from 2017, Mutu reclaimed the mermaid. Depicted by Disney as light-skinned and red-haired, mostly human, and perpetually smiling. Mutu gives her subjects what one reviewer called a defiant ninja strength. This woman has distinctly African features, with a serious, even purposeful expression. Her polished surface looking like she just emerged from the water. Mutu mixes Western and African cultural traditions images from the fashion industry, pornography, and science fiction, trying to move away from cliched depictions that distort and commodify female bodies, that don't feel at all accurate to the way women really are. Historically, representations of the female body have tended to emphasize women's reproductive functions and sexuality. In the Western tradition, some of the earliest depictions of women in art were the Virgin Mary, caring for her child. Later, formal portraits extolling marriage or the bride's beauty and fertility became the standard for portrayals of women. And not long after that, the seductive nude emerged. Many of the same attributes can be found in African visual culture. Mutu began her feminist intervention into these traditions with the figure of the Caryatid, carved pillars of women that have carried buildings to express the might and wealth of a place. 
They are especially associated with ancient Greece, which is appropriate, as the name means priestesses of Artemis at Cariae, a town in Laconia where dance festivals were held in Artemis's temple. There are male Caryatids. Male figures in a like situation are Atlantes, plural in Greek of Atlas. The carved bodies of strong women are also incorporated into many traditions of classical African sculpture, where they represent the divine female in her role as a central pillar and symbolize her responsibility in society. Mutu has said, the work of these women is immense. The regard for them is not. Several elements of the seated three reinforce the cultural tensions manifested in female bodies. The stretched head refers to traditions of binding craniums in high-status individuals, like wealthy women of the Mangbetu, royalty from ancient Kemet, and groups in the ancient Americas. The coils recall neck rings, and the flat discs, lip plates, perhaps more easily seen in the seated one than in the seated three, where the plate has migrated to the back of the head and the drapery evokes rich, complex garments. All of these are traditional symbols of status that are also debilitating. And let us not forget that 21st century American culture, too, has debilitating status symbols. This iconography acknowledges long histories of subordination. At the same time, other elements of the sculpture repudiate those histories. First, in the seated, Mutu released the Karyatid from its role of eternal weight-bearer, but retained the figure's stability, grace, and strength. Next, she worked in bronze, a material associated above all with statues of warriors and conquerors. The work's title describes the sculpture's pose, obviously, with the back straight and knees bent. But the seated is also an expression to convey power, for to be seated is to be installed in a position of authority. And an object that is seated has been attached or positioned firmly. This figure radiates calm authority, sitting relaxed but ready, her pose signaling comfort with her surroundings, yet she remains watchful. The figure's folded legs disguise her height and position her to rise in an instant and when she does, she will tower over humanity. This implies she has power over me, but her serene expression makes it more of a guardianship than a threat. Mutu also pursues a parallel line of inquiry, questioning ideas of who belongs or is welcomed into a society. For her, the seated have the capacity and freedom to be where they need to be and say what they have to say. She says, they are courageous and present, with a calm that comes from knowing they are supposed to be there. The visage on the sculpture is both human and celestial, grafting from different histories. But while the face is familiar, Mutu has also incorporated the iconography of aliens, making a connection with outer space, yes, but with immigrants as well. Mutu reflected on her own experience, saying, as an immigrant, it behooved me to think about what this identity was that wasn't easy to describe. Where are you from? How were you raised? Why do you speak that way? Responding to very simple questions, I realized that I would have to talk about the colonization of my country and how it was before that, if you really want to understand where I come from. Why do we use the term alien to speak of immigrants? It raises all sorts of implications about race and the uses and misuses of geographic boundaries. And why do we make space aliens look like us, but not with huge eyes, tiny noses, little shoulders, smooth skin, and green? By invoking outer space, the seated reminds us of our place in the universe. The disc on the back of her head reinforces that effect by recalling a halo. For this alien, Mutu has clothed her in an armor of bronze coils. A high neck and full-length skirt cover the body modestly. The draping suggests an elegant dress, heavy braids, or ornate jewelry, 
Granting the alien social status often denied the immigrant. The irregularity in the coils gives them a tactile, living, fleshy quality that recall intestines or an umbilical cord, an association I didn't really appreciate until seeing this photo of Mutu applying patina to the sculpture. They also become vines or the primordial snake. Is it protective or is it threatening? For the seated, these accoutrements belie the power contained within the coils, a reserve of energy prepared to spring into motion. Before wrapping up, I want to think about the seated three in relation to other works in the Modern's collection, starting with Henry Moore's two-piece reclining figure number two from 1960. This is also a large bronze sculpture, but with a geological form quite different from the seated three's grace. Although the work is not explicitly female, the reclining posture leads us to assume that it is, in part because of the long tradition of the reclining nude. That tradition is on plain view in Pablo Picasso's Femme Couché Lissant, also from 1960, a recognizably female figure, but quite nude and vulnerable. Recall that Picasso and his fellow Cubists were inspired in part by so-called primitive art from Africa and elsewhere. The Mutu sculpture emphatically rejects the passive reclining body. It resonates as well with Kehinde Wiley's Colonel Platoff on his charger from 2007. Like Mutu, Wiley heroicizes bodies that traditionally have been omitted or diminished in art. I'd like to conclude by comparing the seated three with the work it replaced in this space, Michelangelo Pistoletto's The Etruscan from 1976. There's a material resemblance between the two. They are both figures, both of bronze, both derived from ancient forms. There's also a reversal. The Etruscan was a public figure that Pistoletto took from his pedestal and turned inward. The seated three derives from a household figure, elevated and made public. Like the Etruscan, the seated three has a mirror in the polished surface of the disc. When the sun hits it, light from millions of miles away reverberates in our space. Pistoletto recast a figure from the first century BCE to invite us to consider the nature of time and space. Mutu has cast a figure for the 21st century, using the past to frame our shared future. Thank you for joining me for Slow Art. I hope some of these ideas inspire you in your own encounters with Wangechi Mutu's The Seated Three.